Hey everyone, welcome back. Hope you guys are having a great Tuesday. And thanks so much for coming in to watch this video. We got 23 days or so left before the heavy event. So we're getting closer. Each day we're getting closer, which is a good sign, right? Eventually we'll be on the other side of this and things will look a lot better for us. But in the meantime, we got to take a look at obviously what happened today with the miners. The miners were down for the most part, like majority of the miners were down today. Bitcoin actually squeaked out a green day today. So we'll take a look at that. And then we have some stories. We got BitDeer growing their hash rate into 2024 and into 2025 potentially. We'll take a look at that. We got Marathon, a new product again from them. It's a dual phase immersion cooling. We'll take a look into this. We're going to actually kind of geek out on this quite a bit because um, that guy got me interested into the technology of it. And it's great and it's not great. So we'll take a look at it all. So that's going to be a majority of the video there. And then we'll also take a look at... What else do we have there? Um, wait, there was one more. Oh, potentially Stronghold is getting sued by environmentalists. So we'll take a look at that as well. I think that's kind of everything that we need to cover today. Okay, but as always, you guys know the drill here. This is not financial advice for entertainment only. Please do your own research. I'm best in fine coins and companies for full disclosure. And if you enjoy this type of content, hit the like button, subscribe. Helps me out tremendously. And then any corrections will be posted to Discord, which is through Patreon, YouTube community posts, and Twitter as well. But let's get into what's going on here with the miners and Bitcoin in general. And you can see here that Bitcoin just barely squeaked out a little win today. It was up just 0.15% on the day, closed at 69,994 and six cents. So we still had a green day, not that bad. Uh, but the miners on the other hand are still kind of up and down on the days. Today we can see here that a lot of these miners were down, but they were only down single digits as far as percentage wise. So it wasn't too bad. There wasn't anybody here that was down double digits. So that's fine. We only had Digihost up a little bit, eight up and Iris Energy as well. They were up on the day. So, you know, it's going to be a bumpy ride until we get past the having event, which is right about here or so, give or take a couple days, a day or backwards or forwards a little bit. But that's all we got here right now. Um, I think we're still really, relatively early in this space like i keep saying and i think the best days are yet to come for us but we still got plenty of time okay but let's take a look at the stories that we do have here today and then we'll get into whatever else we have here um so first one's going to be on bitdeer so bitdeer announces mining expansion with seal miner mining machines those are their own soft mining or their own machines the, their own a6 the only thing i don't have data on them as far as what is their terra hash per machine we know the kind of jewels per terra hash is supposed to be about 18.1. So that's kind of what I'm going with here on that. And I'm guessing there may be like the 200 terra hash miners. Could be less. I don't know. Right. So that's kind of what we're going with here, at least right now, until we maybe get some clarification on that information. But here's what we got. So BitDeer today announced a, a hash rate expansion plan of approximately 3.4x the hash as a first step in planning to expand its self mining. This is a good sign because uh, they've been kind of flat here a little bit. The company intends to install its own recently announced seal miner A1 miners and at its mining data centers in Rockdale, Texas, in the United States and Norway in Q3 and Q4 of 2024 to accomplish this initial 3.4 expansion. BitDeer will add approximately 4.8 exahash of hash rate and retire 1.4 exahash of older mining rigs. So this expansion is expected to grow the total proprietary hash rate from 8.4 exahash to approximately 11.8 exahash. That includes their self-mining and then also the other business that they have, which is, I think, um, like leasing the miners or renting the miners, whatever it is in there for them. Okay, then going beyond 2024, uh, several similar expansions for its mining hash rate are expected to follow in subsequent quarters until the end of 2025. The company estimates that it will feasibly add 30 to 40 exahash in its mining data centers to be operational in 2025 and replace an estimated 7 exahash of existing generation mining rigs with newer generation ones, this will result in an estimated 23 exahash of hash of hash rate additional within existing and under construction data centers. BitDeer may not include the total new mining power as part of a company's balance sheet as it may seek cloud hash rate, cloud hosting, and other ways to fund expansion plans. The total hash rate under management as of the end of 2025 may exceed 46 exahash. So that would include everything, right? So it's it's a little tricky the way that they're wording it here. I wish they would have broken it down, but they're basically saying we may put some of the stuff to our own self-mining and some of the stuff to the cloud hash rate, cloud hosting, whatever they are doing with that, uh, those different business lines that they do have here. Uh, based on this, uh, let's go over here and let's go to Bit uh, BitDeer. So BitDeer, as you can see here, their hash rate, where's their hash rate, has actually been um, kind of flat or they actually came down. They were at 7.2 for self-mining. Then it came down to 6.7 here because they moved some of the miners over to their hash rate, uh, hash 
cloud hash services. Um, so you see that there. And then as far as the miners here being added, like I said, I'm guessing that these are 200 terahash miners. They could be less, they could be more. But if that's the case, I have them at 3,620 watts to get to the 18.1 18 .1 joules per terahash on those. And they, like they said, they're going to remove about 1.4 exahash old ASICs. So I split up these two here, which were a combination of 38,500 miners to get to the 1.4 exahash out of there later on when it does happen. But they do have some of these older miners here, the 93 on average. We don't know exactly what they have here, but on average, they're like 93 terahash miners. And that is approximately, uh, what is that? That's 4.3 exahash for self mining there alone. Right. They said they have other machines as well for the other business segments, which we're not including there as well. But I think these are the ones that would be possibly changed out, right? Especially as we get past the having event, network hash rate continues to grow up, things like that. You definitely want to change those out. So that's kind of what we have them at right now. And I have them at 11.08. They said 11.8. So there might be some 800 uh, petahash of difference between what they're saying and what I actually have here written for them. So I might have a mistake here someplace. Okay. I just can't figure out where exactly. Uh, but that is basically it. Nonetheless, the growth is good here, right? If they can continue to grow in 2024 and into 2025, I think that will be a good thing uh, because they definitely need to grow, uh, at least in my opinion. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And we'll get into our next story here, which is going to be a little bit going down the rabbit hole a little with uh, immersion cooling and uh, two-phase immersion cooling and how that all works. Because Marathon today provides us with a press release. So, so Marathon Digital Holdings unveils two-phase immersion cooling system to optimize data center operations. And here's what we have here. So Marathon today announced Mara 2PIC 700, where they have some funny names for these products, a next generation two-phase immersion cooling system built to transform data center operations with industry leading power and density and efficiency. So the 2PIC is two-phase uh, two immersion cooling 700. So I think 700 is for the kilowatts that they're going to be in that. So that's kind of the way that they are naming it. Okay, compared to cur current alternatives, Mara 2 pick 700 enables two to four times the power density and can reduce the space requirements for a data center by up to 75%. It can operate in temperatures ranging from minus 20 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius and is built from remote management. Okay, as a result, the system can be can enable data centers to be built and operated in remote or harsh climates that were previously inaccessible. For Bitcoin mining specifically, Mara 2 pick 700 enables AC miners to be overclocked by 60 to 100%. So if you're talking about uh, basically a 200 terahash miner, you can get that one up to be about 320 to about 400 pe uh, terahash at that point. I don't know if you want to run it for that long. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see. And can enable up to a 60% reduction in cooling costs, even under the most extreme conditions. Okay, so that's interesting. That's obviously a lot of good thing th things there. Uh, but obviously, what is the cost associated with such a system, um, if you wanted to get it, right? How much does the two-phase immersion cooling unit cost itself? What's going to be the ROI time frame on it? Those are all important things, which they don't state here. Uh, but I wanted to go down the rabbit hole on this because I wanted to learn more how all this stuff works. And so I went to Marathon's website here, uh, experienced the next generation of immersion cooling technology. Definitely a cool looking system here. It's all enclosed. And down here, they have some data for us. So compact and modular reduces data centers by 75%, two to four X more power within the same space, up to 60% reduction, right? Built for unmanned operations, spend less time on maintenance, uh, unprecedented overclocking 60 to 100%, cross climate use, right? We talked about that reliable fluid. So this is the interesting part is depending on what fluid they use here. And I'll point you guys out to some drawbacks maybe. Uh, less than 5% annual loss, safe and low environmental impact. Uh, heat recapture ready, efficient high temperature water output for heating applications. So you could hook it up to your dry cooler, basically your air cooler, uh, your dry liquid cooler, I guess it would be. And then you could, I guess, pump the fluid to someplace else to heat another part of the facility, potentially. Uh, going down here, you can see the specs of it. And I actually went to the spec sheet on it. The interesting parts are in here as well. Let me see if I can zoom this in for you guys a little bit, make it a little bit easier to read. Okay, so that's what the unit looks like, right? It's all enclosed because you need the system to be enclosed in order for the dielectric fluid to work properly. Basically what it does, it turns to, into gas when it heats up and then it 
evaporates up. Then you have a heating co um, cooling coil through there that cools it down and it drops back down. But it's definitely a complex system. So I don't expect this to be inexpensive at all, right? I like to see obviously what this costs and then we could possibly run some numbers on it. But here's what they have to say on it. Same, pretty much same things that were on the other page here. Uh, and here's the diagram, basically how it works, right? So you got the AC miners down on the below. You got the miners immersed in dielectric fluid. Heat from the fluid boils liquid coolant into vapor. So that has to do that below basically the uh, chip's operating temperature, I believe, right? So if the chip's operating temperature is, let's say, 40 degrees Celsius, right? That stuff has to basically boil um, at close to that or just a little bit underneath that or a little bit above that, right? Depending on what the temperature ranges are for the chips, right? What can they actually max out at? They can max out at, um, let's just say, 45 degrees Celsius or 48. Then you definitely want that stuff to boil under that, those temperatures, right? So it boils before the chip actually gets to those temperatures there. Uh, vapor coolant comes into contact with condenser coils, transforming coolant back into a liquid, right? So you got the condenser coils here. The condenser coils are uh, basically water inside them, right? That cools it. And then that obviously then drops back down into it. It's a sealed tank, dust and debris. And then you got water output to dry cooler and then water input from dry cooler. So you're basically circulating that water that is in that coils to go through it. So I thought it was kind of interesting way of doing things. All right. Uh, going down here, they state that features two immersion, two phase immersion versus single phase immersion versus air cooled, right? Power density and modular, three stars. Okay, we'll see if that's the case. Two stars for single, one star for air. I mean, for air cooled, you can stack those uh, A6, you know, on a rack 10, 12 feet high up if you want to. Uh, it doesn't really take up that much space, I don't think. I mean, these things are. What are these things? These things are supposed to be, I think they say, yeah, right there, seven foot by four foot by four foot. And I think you can possibly fit maybe what, 16 to 20 miners in there. If you double stack them, maybe you can fit double that, maybe, right? But we don't know. It doesn't stay in here as how, how many miners you can actually stick in here. Uh, but going down here, you can kind of see all the different marks on it. And then I did a just a quick Google search on it and the Google AI. <clears throat> excuse me, came up with a couple of things here. So in two-phase immersion cooling, the liquid undergoes a phase change and becomes a gas. The fluids used in this technology have been found to have toxic side effects, such as cancer and uh, are often called forever chemicals because they don't break down naturally. So 3M Novik, one of the biggest fluids used in the two-phase immersion cooling, is a per- and polyfluoroalkali substance, PFAS, right? Um, you guys may not know this, but PFAS is being heavily regulated here by the, in the United States by EPA right now. They're trying to get rid of it completely. Um, and you might be surprised that a lot of the things that you have around your house have PFAS in them. Um, before, if you remember a Scotch guard and things like that, that were protecting your fabrics and your couches and carpets, they had PFAS in them. Uh, because of this, their manufacture and use are being regulated and restricted worldwide, right? So those are the old substances that were used in this. And then Chemors is a chemical supplier that has entered into the two-phase immersion cooling fluids market with their product Option. T, uh, 2P50, which is a hydrofluoroolefin, uh, uh, HFO, dielectric fluid. Chemors claims that the Option 2, 2P50 has a lower global warming potential than other two-phase immersion cooling fluids. So that got me kind of interesting. What, what are they talking about there with the global warming, uh, global warming potential? So I went to a couple other websites, and here's what I found out as well on top of this stuff here. And then Chemors here actually has... Uh, their launch, I guess you could say, or press release on launching this product here. Looked into this and it kind of covers the same stuff that's in there. I also went to their website to find out about the fluid here. And their fluid here is, let's see, global warming potential 10.8. Uh, don't know if that's good or bad. Wanted to figure that out, but you can obviously see all these things here. I also wanted to check out if they have an SDS so safety data sheet on this. They don't have it on their website right now. It's all of these other products, but they don't have the Optium 2P50 on here right now which is surprising. And I think that's because they stated here, it's a developmental dielectric heat transfer fluid. So they're still working on this potentially. Okay, so let's go back to here. So I thought this was kind of interesting in here as well. Uh, for two-phase fluids to operate effectively as a heat transfer fluid, they must have a boiling point below the operating temperature of the device you are cooling because they remove heat through the phase process of transitioning from a liquid to a gas. Yeah, so if you're 
ASIC chip works at uh, normal temperatures around, let's just say 48 degrees Celsius. You know, that's kind of how high it can go. You want something that's gonna obviously boil at a much at a lower temperature to keep it uh, cool. The most important, the most common two-phase dielectrics belong to a group of chemicals called fluorinated fluids. Fluorinated fluids have a relatively low boiling points, are extremely dense, often two to three times that of water and are very expensive, okay? So there's obviously some cause for a little more investigation, right? Why is it so much more expensive and things like that? Does it actually make sense to use these two-phase immersion uh, systems uh, or not? So we're going to kind of go through this as fast as I can here. So two-phase coolants can produce very high pressures in systems because they must transition to a gas and then be recondensed to remove heat from a system. This requires a complex system with significant sa safety systems in place to ensure there is no buildup of pressure or that the coolant is simply boiled off into the workplace environment. Okay. The boiling action of two-phase systems creates microcavitations, which erodes the metals on the electronics devices you are cooling, as well as the metal components of the cooling systems. This erosion can cause your electric devices to malfunction or fail due to broken trace and connectors. In addition, your devices risk catastrophic failure, especially in power supplies. Due to buildup of these eroded metals, metallic part particles, particles in a coolant. Eventually, this metallic particles contamination destroys the dielectric strength of a coolant, causing shorting uh, between systems. So one way to possibly solve that would be maybe to have uh, filtration or something like that. Um, most two-phase cooling systems require water be brought directly into the data room to chill the condenser and remove the collected heat. Anytime you have high pressure water in the data room, you have a significant risk of failure. Obviously, right, we don't want water in the electronics. Unlike single-phase coolants, two-phase coolants will simply evaporate or boil away unless they are fully contained. Fluorinated fluids are very expensive, and so is their replacement due to loss, right? So they're saying Marathon is saying less than 5% loss in a year. I mean, if you have a bunch of these systems in place, it's going to be pretty costly. The other dangerous side effect of two-phase fluorinated coolants becoming an aerosol is that, they, that you can breathe in these fumes, and then they recondense in your lungs. Because fluorinated fluids are heavier than water, and are inert, they can remain in your lungs longer, long after you have been exposed. In addition, these two-phase coolants will recondense on everything throughout the data room, leaving a toxic dew throughout your facility. Now, that's not good. Right, and I like, uh, again, unlike uh, our single-phase coolants, which have a global warming potential of zero, yes, zero fluorinated fluids have a uh, global warming potential of over 9,000. Just for comparison, carbon dioxide has a uh, global warming potential of one, and methane has a global warming potential of 56. So Chemors, uh, not Chemors, yeah, Chemors, says theirs is 10. So it's obviously more than what we have for carbon dioxide, but less obviously than for methane, methane at least right now. The other thing is when they were talking about the uh, forever chemicals, PFAS, Chemors does uh, kind of avoid the question here a little bit in this article about whether or not their product will be listed as a PFAS, right? Uh, PFAS issues are complex, and there's no global working definition to rely on classifying components, compounds. So we'll have to see if that even gets through this. Uh, but that's the only thing I can think of that maybe Marathon's going to be using here, because based on the other things that they were talking about, the other chemicals being cancer-causing and everything else, it's like, why would you even want to use that stuff? And having a 9,000 PW, whatever that was, PW, ah, where is it at? Yeah, GWP, right? If it's over 9,000, that's some nasty stuff there. You don't want to be messing with this stuff. And if it's costly, but we'll see. We need more details, obviously, from Marathon as far as what fluid they're using. I don't know if we're going to get that. They're going to probably say it's uh, proprietary. And then uh, just what is the cost of the system itself, right? Uh, so that's going to be interesting. And then does that also include the uh, air dryer or not? Or is that separate? Something else you have to buy. So there's a lot of questions to it. And then I thought found this was interesting also because today I was listening to the H.C. Wainwright interview with the Clean Spark, and this was actually on Jesse's web, um, YouTube channel. Uh, Jesse has definitely helped me out on Twitter and things like that, growing my audience there. So thank you to Jesse for that, and then I'm going to use Jesse here for the time being. But they actually go into speaking uh, about the immersion cooling, the double-phase immersion cooling as well, and I thought we would just take a listen to it here really quick. Uh, it's, it's maybe a minute or two in detail on this, but I thought this was just kind of maybe, I don't know if it's a coincidence or if it was planned or not, but they're obviously taking a little jab here at the double, uh, double, not double, dual phase immersion cooling on it. So 
Let's take a quick listen to it. And again, thanks for Jesse on this. So credit to him. You can check him out. Here's his uh, handle for YouTube. But let's listen in here. You know, looking at mining infrastructure, most of your data centers right now are air cooled with the exception of about 20 megawatts or so deployed at your North Cross facility in Georgia that uses immersion. Um, what observations have you made as relates to cost differences and performance differences of air cooled versus immersion? And uh, would you consider using immersion for future data center locations? We see different miners taking different approaches to this. So we'd love to hear your views. Yeah, we're going to take the right approach for the right places. And there's absolutely places where immersion makes more sense. You know, uh, Matt mentioned Taylor Monarch, our senior vice president of mining, he really, right, you know, keeps everything online and running on the mining side. He has several patents in both single and dual phase immersion. So he, he used to, you know, be a founder of a company that built those. So we are probably more versed in a background in education, as Matt mentioned finding experts that are experts are the best things in that. And the fact that we're building error in certain places, what we're looking for is ROI. So we know all the benefits that immersion can bring, but if you, for example, have to spend, you know, more money on something, we're looking at the time it takes to hash that back. So anything that's a hundred dollars more, right. In total cost, it, you know, current mining, it may take seven to 10 days to earn that hundred dollars back from a single miner, let's say, right? So we measure everything that way. Two phase, for example, it's, it's something that's being talked about a lot. One of the reasons it doesn't make any sense is because the fluid is so expensive that sometimes the payback on that is never yeah, before you have to, you know, change your fluid, adjust it, do things, you know, whatever it may, it may be. Also, there's so much R and D that goes into it. You're going to notice that we are not um, releasing a bunch of headlines to talk about R and D projects and side projects. We do one thing and we do one thing really, really well. And that's mining. We have owned manufacturers. We own a switch gear manufacturer. We don't anymore. And we sold the business with the energy company years ago because one, there's more margin in Bitcoin mining. But it takes a lot of expertise to run that and margins are thin. So why would we own a switch gear company? Why would we manufacture our own tanks when there's experts that make immersion tanks, right? So point being is I kind of work backwards through this. We know air, we build air. We also can build immersion. When we do build immersion, it's a single phase immersion because it's the most cost effective. And so I'm driving to a point here, which is cost. When we built our immersion site, we wanted it to be big enough to experience a real deployment, 20 megawatts. It's not small, but it also what we weren't going to bet the farm on 150 megawatts of immersion. We wanted to learn and experience in a real time way. And we've now run that site for well over a year and we've learned a lot from it, but only now have costs adjusted to where we can now go out with our connections and our vendors. We can build an immersion facility for about the same cost as an air cooled facility, which means now we get to measure not just on the build cost ROI, but now what does it do for the miners? We can get great performance out of air cooled miners. We can get slightly better performance out of the immersion miners, 15 to 30% better. Anything beyond that, you start to lose efficiency, which means we're not making as much money. And so that's what we pay attention to first as a strategic point. Um, so now we're looking at this in a new way. Now, as we launch into 24, I do think that we will build more immersion, but I am not going to say that every site we're going to build is going to be immersion. I just think that we're going to build a lot more immersion. I think that there's still going to be great opportunities for air cooled, be great opportunities for immersion. For example, though, it's also a lot quieter. There are pockets in places that we've looked at we haven't built because nobody again wants a noisy Bitcoin miner you know, too close to anything. Our immersion facility sits in middle of a community and there are, you know, houses across the parking lots from our facility. It's incredibly quiet. You don't know we're there and we're Bitcoin mining based on the reputation of it being noisy. That is a perfect example of why to use immersion mining over air cool. And then the other thing is, again, the miners last longer. So as we're bringing in this new fleet of machines that we think as an extremely long shelf life into the next halving, that's a great time to take those brand new miners that are going to be 
you want to put in a tank and leave them there for three or four years, you build an immersion facility. So all of those reasons together, yes, you're going to see us build more immersion in the coming year, but we are going to walk, not run into it, even with a, because of our expertise on this, knowing you have to get it right, or you can spend a whole lot of money and it'll never pay back. That's great. Really, really insightful on the immersion side. And Matt, I, I recall last time you know, I was down to your Norcross facility, uh, there were several analysts. I was not one of them doing samples of your immersion fluid out there. So um, although it looked like Mountain Dew and it's a, a nice tasty soda, I, I did not partake in that. So it uh, be interesting to see what you guys do next. So, um, so just real quick on that point, Mike, that the fluid in single phase immersion that we use is uh, it's effectively mineral oil. Okay. It's um, it's not an environmental contaminant. It's biodegradable. Um, it has, has no legacy that you have to worry about. The current fluid available on dual phase, um, not only is it north of $300 a gallon, but under certain circumstances, pressure and temperature, it can convert to the same chemical element as mustard gas. So when we look at and evaluate these opportunities, First and foremost, you have to think about the safety of the people operating that and then the surrounding communities. So, you know, to your point, I think you were, you, you were there, Dan Weiskopf from the Block ETF, you know, put his put his finger in the fluid and tasted it and posted it on Twitter. And, and you know, you probably shouldn't do that, but, but you can. But that's just evidence or proof positive that there, you know, there are a lot of benefits to single phase immersion. Uh, and that's why we've chosen to, to kind of balance that approach. That's great. And, and all right, there you go, guys. So that's basically their take on it. And you can see why they are not all full blown into it, even though Tyler has plenty of experience into that field, which I thought was kind of interesting also. And then if you take that and then just look at what CleanSpark has been doing as far as just their only focus is on Bitcoin mining, right? Marathon, we're seeing just in the release and weeks get into uh, ordinals where they're doing the slipstream, they're doing other things. It's just like they're all over the place. And yet, their production, their facilities has been suffering, and it's not because of that, but maybe they don't have the eye, uh, maybe they don't have the eyeballs on the actual operation side of things. And if they didn't have, you know, people working on other things, maybe could they have done a little bit better for their own, uh, you know, self mining? Possibly, uh, we just don't know that because we're not in there. But based on this, the only thing that I can say is I wish Marathon would pay more attention to their self mining. And the stuff that they are doing, the stuff that they are doing is pretty cool, but let other people maybe do that. Don't try to be the all in house encompassing everything else. Maybe, maybe just focus on one thing and be great at that thing. Um, but we'll see how this all works out for them. I don't see this being a huge business for them going forward. Um, it's just like an ancillary side of the business, but we'll see. Uh, things I would like to see, obviously, is what is the cost on those immersion cooling systems, dual phase? What chemicals are they using in there right now, right? And then what is the expected ROI on those machines, depending if you're in a bear market or if you're in a bull market in Bitcoin, right? And then, yeah, just, I think that would probably solve a lot of the questions that I have, but that's it. Let me know what you guys think of this. Obviously this was a pretty big deep dive into all this dual phase immersion stuff. And if you guys have any questions on it, uh, I probably should have gotten Tyler on here or talked to Tyler from CleanSpark since he has patents on these things and he knows all this stuff might've been kind of cool to kind of pick his brain a little bit. And maybe we can do that on a Twitter space or something like that. Maybe get him on this Saturday, maybe. Maybe, that'd be kind of cool. Okay, but that's it there. Let's get into the rest of the stuff that we have to cover. And the last thing we're gonna, two last things, I actually forgot this, BitDigital. Um, BitDigital has another great news story here for them. So BitDigital Inc. announces a customer proposal to expand existing agreement by an additional 2,048 GPUs. This will bring them up to what, for like 4,000 something now. 4096 yet. Yeah. So BitDigital is pleased to announce that it has received a proposal from its existing customer for BitDigital AI to significantly expand the scope of its existing agreement. The proposal calls for an additional 2048 GPUs amounting to a total of 4086 GPUs. Under the amended agreement, BitDigital intends to accept the customer proposal subject to agreement on certain terms and conditions, at which point it would help the company towards achieving its goal of for its BitDigital AI business to reach 100 million run rate for annualized revenue. So this is great news there. The big thing is obviously we want to see what is the profit margins on it. That's what I've been hounding on. And I think that's what a lot of investors are also waiting on to possibly uh, get into bit digital, right? Right now, we just don't know what that entails. How profitable is it actually? 
right? It could be hundred million, but if you're only making fifteen million dollars in profit on that, that's not that great, right? And I think we spoke with um, Sam on Twitter Spaces, and I asked him the question: What is the break-even uh, profit margin for Bitcoin compared to AI? And he said, for that to be the same, it would be basically Bitcoin being at a hundred thousand, which is not that far away. And at that point, Bitcoin goes above that, then you're making obviously a lot more from Bitcoin self-mining than you would be from this AI stuff. And at that point, does it make sense for them to be AI side of things? And should they be maybe just focusing more on the self-mining part of the business? Okay, so that's kind of what we're looking at there. But this is obviously great news. We want to see the AI numbers for that uh, for the first quarter. And I think we will see that a little bit, which will obviously help investors. We will see how they're doing. Okay, but this is great news nonetheless. And hopefully this works out really well for them. Now, last one here is a little bit of a FUD story, I think maybe. Maybe not, we'll see. But crypto miner Pennsylvania hit with a lawsuit over pollution from Bitcoin mine, right? So an environmental community group on Tuesday sued Stronghold Digital Mining, claiming the company's Bitcoin mine in north northeastern Pennsylvania that burns waste coal and old tires for energy is polluting nearby communities with dangerous chemicals, right? Anytime you burn uh, rubber or anything like that, you obviously you're putting out a bunch of chemicals into the air unless you have the systems in place to capture all those pollutants, uh, which I would think that uh, Stronghold would have, but I don't know. Uh, the lawsuits by Safe Carbon County filed in state court in Philadelphia also names Pennsylvania as the defendant. The group, a nonprofit whose members live near the Bitcoin mine, is seeking compensatory and punitive damages from the company and an order directing the state to stop allowing the pollution to continue. Right. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of good that's done by Stronghold. They use, they even spoke about it here, I believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, here it is. Stronghold's facilities have cleaned up millions of tons of waste coal and reclaimed over 1,050 acres of un, once uh, blighted land, now sport fields, parks, and fishing spots for local communities, the spokesperson said. So I agree there, right? The only thing is now is how much do they actually pollute through their, through, through their stacks uh, in the power plants that they do use? Do they have sufficient safety measures and things like that to capture the pollutants at that point. Uh, but, you know, this obviously is going to play out in court. We'll see how it goes. But this is definitely not uh, good on Stronghold, at least not right now. But, you know, innocent until proven guilty. So hopefully they have the measures in place and they get through this without a problem. But that's basically it. So uh, kind of busy day as far as news stories are concerned and a lot of things that were kind of interesting, like we talked about, especially with the... Immersion, two-phase immersion cleaning from bit farms. We'll see what that actually entails. Maybe we'll get some more details later on. Um, and yeah, we'll see what, what happens. But we're getting closer to the having events. Things are getting more and more interesting. We got companies, you know, getting into AI. We got companies getting into immersion cooling and um, computer boards and software. <laughs> and it's just starting to get a little crazy out there right now, I think. Uh, but we'll see. All right. I'm still very bullish on all the things, and we'll see how we already go, where things go from there. But that's it. I'm going to start rambling on here. <clears throat> My throat's starting to kill me a little bit. I've been talking too long. So I wish you guys a great night. Thank you so much for coming in here. And then if you enjoy this type of content, hit like button, subscribe. helps me out tremendously. And then tomorrow we'll do a live stream. We'll see what happens tomorrow in the markets. If not, if there's nothing interesting going on, I'll just probably do like a Q&A for you guys. Okay? But that's it. Again, thank you so much for coming in. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.